Hi, my name is Derek Hughes. I'm the worship leader here at the Point Community Church in Frankfurt. Thank you for taking time to watch this video. Here at the Point, we take God's Word very seriously, and we place a high emphasis on preaching and teaching Scripture. While we're excited to share this sermon with you in this way, we also want to encourage you to be a part of a local church. We're commanded in Scripture to consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. If you're not a part of a local church, we'd love to have you with us on Sunday mornings at 1030. Even before I touch on 1 Corinthians, just as I was standing there, I was thinking about this passage of Scripture, and I just wanted to read it to you and over us just as a reminder and maybe just to set up, like, like setting up even the Easter service uh, and Easter day by, by going back and looking at what we celebrated on Good Friday and what, um, what Paul writes in, I'm going to re- be reading from Romans, the fifth chapter, just um, just listen to this, and may this do our hearts good. That Paul says that for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Is that not good news, right? Oh, man. Like, push that into our hearts this morning. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we will also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have now received reconciliation. Isn't that good news? Doesn't that, I always I say it's like, that frees us, right? Like even what we're going to talk about today, like that frees us from our need to hide, our need to run, our need to try to clean ourselves up. Like that frees us just to be, to be honest, to stand and to look at a Savior, knowing everything about us and yet dying for us. And may that be our confession that he is the Savior, not us. That he come to save sinners as Paul even says, like, uh, of whom I am, I am chief, of whom I am foremost as a sinner. And that frees us just to be honest about our sin. It, it, it magnifies his grace. It magnifies the gift that he's given. When we don't diminish our sin, but we're honest with our sin and we bring it before him, looking to him, the one who came to die for our sin and who was resurrected to give us new life. And so, uh, Let's pray, and then let's look at 1 Corinthians for sermon number two, okay? Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your word, and it speaks truth to us. That as you said, and John recorded in John 8, that you speak the truth that you've come to set us free from our sin. That may we experience, even today, freedom from our, from our sin as we are honest. May we f- experience freedom from the guilt and the pain that we feel. I pray for those in the room that don't feel guilt and pain for their sin. I pray for those in the room who have somehow justified themselves before you, whether it be for their, from their own moral performance or from their religious performance or whatever it may be, that may we, as we look at a bloody cross, as we think about an empty tomb, May we just be honest. May we just be open. May we just see you, Jesus, as everything that you are. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Today, just simply, like, um, I don't feel that, like, Easter is all that different for us as it it may be for other churches, just because we kind of have chosen to kind of 
to, to use as the hub, the cross and the resurrection. And so like, ev- I feel like hopefully every week we're looking at the cross and the resurrection and f- what that means for us. So it's not like this, like, like this week I felt like, like pressure to say something new about the cross and the resurrection. And then at, at one point, like l- l- yesterday afternoon, I was just like, geez, like, like, like you don't need, we don't need anything new, Right? Like, well, all we need is the beautiful truth of the cross and resurrection. And may we just let our hearts marinate in that truth and be reminded of that truth as even what we see Paul doing in 1 Corinthians 15. He's going back to say, let me remind you of these truths. And so just the, the, the idea, the big idea from this text that we're going to see today is simply this, that because Jesus has been resurrected from the dead, that believers, like that's underlined, Like Paul's writing this to encourage believers that Paul is concerned about encouragement to believers. He's trying to clear up a little bit of false teaching that has kind of infiltrated um, this, you know, the, the church at Corinth. So he's cleaning that up with this letter, but he's also writing it in order to encourage believers that Paul saw an audience those that would hear this, and he divided that up into two groups. There are those who are believers, believing in the perfect, atoning, uh, uh, sufficient work of Christ, those people clinging to Jesus. And then there is another group that he thought of that he would categorize as unbelievers, the unconverted, the false converts, people that are clinging to other things, people that are denying Jesus, that are playing games with Jesus, that aren't, haven't surrendered to Jesus, aren't living lives incongruent with, with, with what the gospel proclaims in their lives. They're just kind of doing their own deal. Like this isn't an encouragement for those cats. I shouldn't even say that, should I? For those people, right? Like it's not an encouragement for those people. It is an encouragement for those who are believers, not the perfect, but those who are clinging to a perfect Savior. And because Jesus has been resurrected from the dead, then believers can rest that our sins have been forgiven. We can joyfully pursue new life in him. And we can trust that we will experience eternity free from the presence of sin and in the presence of God. So that's really what, we're, what we see in this text, that Paul starts off in verses 1 and 2 with just a reminder. He says this simply, that now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel, the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and in which you, in which you stand, that this term, the gospel, is an important term to Paul. It simply means, as we saw here, it's a message that he preached to them. It's what they believed in that in order that, that saved them. It is, a, it is the good news. It's a message. It's a, it's a proclamation that he made to them. And Paul's concerned that the gospel stays unpolluted, that people understand what is the gospel and what isn't the gospel, and that the gospel stay, stays untainted. In fact, Paul writes to the church at, in, in Galatia, and Paul says this. He says that if, if we... Or an angel from heaven preached to you a gospel other than the gospel that was first preached to you. Like, may we be accursed. So Paul's concerned that even that he in himself could start believing and preaching and teaching a gospel that isn't the true gospel. This polluted form of the gospel. And then his fear was that people on the other end, that they would believe in something other than the truth the authentic, the true gospel. And so even for us, we got to say like, am I believing in this truth of the good news or am I believing in something else that I've made up, some, something else that, that, that has been taught to me, some other tradition? And so thankfully, Paul gives for us like, so you understand what is the gospel, let me give the gospel to you. And so that follows. He says about this about it. He said, it's by which, in verse 2, that you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. This is a theme here throughout uh, 1 Corinthians 15 is this idea of is is what we're believing in, what we're saying, what we're what we're preaching, what we're teaching. Is it is it bear fruit or is it in vain? Like is it sufficient or is there something else that, that we need? Paul says here, for I delivered to you as of first importance. 
So here's what the gospel is. This is what's of first importance. What I also received, and here it is. You ready? A couple of things. You can jot these down. If you've got a skinny, take them out and jot these down. Here's the crux of the gospel. One, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with scriptures. Two, that he was buried. Three, that Christ was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Four, and that he and that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So what Paul's saying here is, here's the of first importance. And it comes down, boils down to the gospel. The gospel is simply these four, these four, not just truths. Like what I, what I want you to see, even this morning, that maybe, you're, maybe, maybe you see this, you've seen this in the past, or maybe you're seeing it for the first time, is what sets Christianity apart. What makes Christianity unique is, is not just these truths, but that these are historical events that all of Christianity is hung upon the nail and that nail is Christ's death and Christ's resurrection, which are historical truths, historical events, things that really happened in the past that, that, that the whole of Christianity is built upon this foundation And that if you move this foundation of Christ's death and Christ's resurrection, then the whole house of cards falls in. That all other faith traditions are based upon a person's uh, a, a person's personal experience with something outside of themselves. A guy finds underneath a a a, a, a haystack, right? He finds a, a some kind of scroll, some kind of tablet. And then he translates that. A guy goes into a cave, experiences something, comes back out, translates it, and gives it to people. That, it, that all other faith traditions, we even see this as we looked at last week, as we've been in, those of us that attend the Point Community Church, we see we've been in the book of Exodus. And we see this in Moses. Moses goes out by himself, right? And he has a burning bush experience hears all of this, experiences this, and then he goes back to the, the Israelite elders and God gives him these signs, you know, like here's this sign and here's this sign in order to get them to believe. But Christianity is even the new covenant of Christianity is different than even the beginning, the genesis of the old covenant. And that God is not just using somebody's like experience and then their charismatic personality in order to see this experience or this teaching or this truth explode. But what God's hanging it all on here is a historical, real event. The death and the resurrection, the, re- the death and the resurrection of Christ. And look how, even Paul, look how even Paul puts it here. I've delivered to you the first importance that Christ has died. Christ, he was buried on the... And then he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then look that he appeared to. He appeared to Peter. He appeared to the other 12. He appeared to 500 at one time. That what Paul's even saying here as a reminder to us, that our faith doesn't hang on the absence of someone, but rather on the presence of someone. That we don't just have an empty tomb, right? Like Paul's laying this out in 1 Corinthians 15 like an argument, like a, like a good lawyer would. Like here's this argument. And Paul's not saying exhibit A is the empty tomb. Here's some pictures of the empty tomb. Some of you, you've seen and you've toured the empty tomb. I mean, I got to go over and see and tour the empty tomb, right? Beautiful, awesome. I mean, if that is in fact the tomb, I mean, it's you know pretty powerful explanation of it. Got to see it. It was, it was fantastic getting to experience that, but he's saying here that it's not just an empty tomb. Like everything isn't just on 
an empty tomb, the absence, where's the body? There would be other explanations of that. What Paul's pointing to here is not just the absence of a, of a person, But he's saying we have the presence of a resurrected Jesus that is showing up all over the place. Like there's a period of time prior to Jesus' ascension that Jesus just shows up and reveals himself to people. This is like a bodily resurrected Christ, not ghost hunters, right? Like you see that show and it's like, oh, I felt him. You know, like something just went by. Did you all get that on this? You ever seen that show? You know, did you get that? Like, it's not that. It's not what some of you like, you know, have grown up maybe and like your, your mom or your somebody, your aunt or your grandparents say like, you know, every, every Thursday evening, grandpa shows up and sits in that rocking chair and the rocking chair just kind of like rocks back and forth, you know? Like, it, like it's not that. This is a bodily resurrected, like grandpa in the rocking chairs never cooked breakfast for grandma, right? Like Jesus shows up and cooks breakfast on on, on the shore for his disciples. Fish for breakfast at that, you know? Catfish for breakfast doesn't sound all bad, does it? Right? Cracker barrel. Focus. It's Easter. We eat ham on Easter, right? All right. Stay focused. Don't be thinking about fish because you're not going to get it. You're going to get ham today. Why is that? I mean, turkey on Thanksgiving makes sense. Ham on Easter, other than it's just like this blatant, like we're under the new covenant now. We're going to eat pork, right? If you're going to eat ham today, raise your hands. Let's just see it. Okay. I don't know. I don't get it, but that's it. He cooks fish. He shows up. Thomas, put your finger in the holes. Stick your, a bodily resurrection. It is a resurrected body. It's different than ours. He shows up in places, but we got to understand it's not a, it's not a spirit. It's not a ghost. And he shows up And she reveals himself to like over 500 people see him. And now Paul, just a few years later, is writing this letter to this church at Corinth. And even says like some of these people have fallen asleep, but most of them are alive in a way to say, call them in as eyewitnesses. Like you think I'm joking that Christ has been resurrected from the dead? Call these people Let them come and let them testify to you that they've seen a resurrected Jesus. And may that do our hearts good. Like I get it that oftentimes we struggle in our faith. Like everything is predicated upon faith. Like it's set up from the beginning. The just shall live by faith. We talk about faith that ultimately, what are we holding on to? We're holding on to a faith, a belief. And I understand that there are times that many of us are plagued with doubt, like real paralyzing doubt. We think like, is this for real? Am I doing this? We, the same thing here Paul's saying, it's like only we're asking ourselves that is, is all of this in vain? Is my living like this in vain? Is me killing my flesh in vain? I think oftentimes we paint Christianity to be like the easy road, right? Like get saved and, and, and your dog will stop peeing on the carpet and your kids will be, you know, will learn how to tie their shoes perfectly and you'll never get colds anymore and your car will never start and you'll get all this money from heaven just filling into your, your mailbox. Like raise your hand if that's been your experience in, Christ, in the Christian faith. No. In fact, it's far more difficult to live as a believer than it is to live as an unbeliever. I'm not saying saying there's more joy in being an unbeliever, but I will say there's more difficulty in being a believer. Why? Because you're killing sin. Because you're asked to do tough things. You're asked to endure tough marriages. You're asked to endure tough jobs. You're asked to go and have tough conversations. You're asked to be tough on yourself as you kill sin in you, as you say no to pleasures and worldly pleasures and say yes to the things of God. Like you, right? You feel that. And oftentimes you go like, am I doing all of this for nothing? What Paul's saying here is take heart. 
Yes, it's ultimately on faith, but God, by his grace, has given us an historical event. He's given us a, a true a, a true thing that has occurred. The resurrection of Jesus and Jesus appearing to all of these people who are eyewitnesses, who are verifying it. You have the, the, the beginning of the church like this that he's talking about, the resurrection of Christ and Christ appearing. Not just, so, oh, the, bo- the body's gone, but Christ appearing. Christ appearing right there at the, at the breakfast and affirming to Peter his love for Peter. His call to Peter, Peter, go and feed my, go and feed my sheep. That's what I want you to do, Peter. You see this guy that just days before was scared of a little girl. You know, he's sitting at a fire warming himself. A little girl shows up. Aren't you with Jesus? You know, blasphemy. No, I'm not with Jesus. I don't even know who the joker is. What are you talking about? Days later, this guy stands up to a massive crowd and preaches the gospel. 3,000 people are converted. They believe in it. You have, this, you, have, you have a spark. These eyewitnesses account that ignites a fire that is the church. Complete wildfire. And you have the church in, in a span of 30 years going from this small Jewish sect all the way, reaches all the way to Rome. What, what ignites that? It's this experience they had with Christ. It's them seeing and spending time with Jesus. And the church thrives even in the face of terrible persecution. And yet the church thrives. I mean, it's not like bandwagon Jesus, right? It's not like, woo, Jesus. We go down into, it reminds me of like bandwagon sports folks. Go down to, when I go down to, to Haiti, we, the kids, you know, the kids in Haiti, they all play uh, football, which is soccer, right? So they all play that. And some of us from Kentucky went, and we thought it was a good idea that we taught them basketball because that's the, a real sport, you know? Not anybody could kick a ball, but basketball. And so, like, we took a ball goal down and hung it up, and, and we cut out with plywood a, a, a backboard and put it up. And one of the kids, like two years ago, one of the kids took some paint and wrote LeBron and then put Miami Heat on there, right? And then the last time I went down, the Miami Heat had an X on it. Underneath of it said Cavs, you know? It was like, now we're all Cavalier fans, you know? Forget Miami Heat, we're Cavalier fans now. And like, that's bandwagon. People do that, right? None of you would do such a thing, but that, that happens. In fact, some of you all bought UK shirts yesterday, didn't you? You jinxed us just, I mean, it's like an elephant in the room. I got to say it. Jesus isn't, like they're not on the bandwagon. It's not pro-Jesus. It's confess Jesus and get beat. Confess Jesus and get stoned. Confess Jesus and get beheaded. And yet they confess Jesus. Why? How? Because they believe these men who are multiple men and women who've seen a resurrected Christ. In fact, like that's, like that's the Easter question. I think that's the question, not just Easter, but that's the question for all of us that we all have to, like we have to answer that. Like, did Jesus, was Jesus resurrected from the dead? Or is this a hoax? Or that was a hoax. I mean, that's, that's, that's the question you got to answer even today. Not, is the Easter bunny real? Not, where do we hide the eggs? But the question you have to answer in your own heart of hearts is, was Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead? Or whatever that other explanation is. Because if Jesus was resurrected from the dead, that validates who he was and all that he taught. Namely, that he is God. I mean, you take a, a bunch of monotheistic Jews. Like, like, I know sometimes we paint the disciples as a bunch of like 
hillbillies, you know, that God, fishermen that God calls, but they're not. These men, they grew up in a Jewish tradition. They're, they're, they're monotheistic. They believe in one God, and Jesus shows up. And then prior to that, it's not that they become pantheistic or polytheists. It's not that they believe in a bunch of gods, but they understand that Jesus is God. They understand even, like, the Trinity. Like, they, they understand all of that. They, they get that. And, like, how, why? It's because of the truth of who he is. It's his resurrection validated everything. All of his claims are validated by Jesus' resurrection. And I think if you affirm that, like, you can't affirm that like you would another historical event. Like, I know I just, oh, you know, it all hangs on this historical event, Jesus' life and death and resurrection, but you can't affirm it like you would the sinking of the Titanic or, you know, people walking on the moon. Like, I know there are some of you here who have family members that deny that, you know, anyone's ever walked on the moon. They're like, no, no, that was a set, and that was a government conspiracy and all of that. And, like, that's not what we're talking about. Like, what's the implications, whether we did or we didn't? Oh, we have a government we can trust or we can't trust? Like, hello, like, surely we can say there's other arguments that we can have that be far more beneficial than that. What, what, what the resurrection of Christ means, if Christ was resurrected from the dead, what he demands of us is a radical reorientation of your life around that truth. And as Pastor Brian said, th- this is the most profound truth that we can ever talk about, that we can ever claim. And why is it profound? It's not just profound in history, but it's profound to us as we look at it, that it calls for a radical reorientation of our lives. That what Paul does in this first part of 15, he says this, that here's what God has done for us. One, God sent his son to die, to pay the penalty for our sins. Number two is that he was brutally put to death and buried in the tomb. But number three, God has publicly resurrected him from the dead, and he has appeared to over 500 witnesses. And then Paul gives for us instructions in how we respond to that truth. Like, here's the truth. Here's not just what he's done, but why he's done it. And now here's how you respond to that truth is, number one, Paul says that you receive it. He says, the gospel that I preach to you, which, which you received. There's a, there's a point in time that you receive the gospel. You receive the truth of the gospel. You receive who Jesus is. You believe in him. You confess that over your life. You believe in your heart. You believe it in your heart, and you confess it with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is God. You receive this truth of who he is. That's what step one, you you receive it. Paul puts it even in the past tense to the church in Corinth. There was a time when you received it, past tense. He's writing to believers. Today, I would say to you, like, have you received it? And if not, would you receive it today? Like, let today be the day of salvation for you and receive Christ as Lord. Not Christ as homeboy. Not Christ as good teacher. Not Christ as anything else. Not even Christ as, as, as historical figure. But receive Christ as, as Lord and Lord over your life. As Christ as God and Christ as Savior. Receive him. But it says it just didn't stop in even your past as being a past tense experience. He says that you received him and now look in which you stand. You're receiving him and then there's a a time when you're standing in him. When you're enjoying him. You're standing firm in him. Verse 2, and by which you are being saved. I love good stuff, right? You receive it, and then it is at work in us, 
continuing to save us. It's not like, okay, are we still flipping the coin whether or not we're going to go to heaven or hell? Uh, It's not like the daisy, he loves me, he loves me not, I'm saved today, not saved tomorrow. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is the same thing he'll say in Philippians to the Philippian church. It's that you're working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both the will and to do according to his good pleasure. You're being saved as you are working out the salvation that you've received. When you've received Christ as Lord, guess what? Your flesh doesn't want to submit to Christ as Lord. So you have to do the work of killing your flesh and continually submitting your heart, submitting your life to Christ as Lord. That's the process of being saved. That's the process that all of us as believers that we're living in evidence of us believing in it. We're being saved. He says we're, we're holding fast to the gospel. That as we hold fast to Jesus in the gospel, then Jesus of the gospel is holding fast to us. We're being saved by it. And then he says, and just know this, that your faith is not in vain. It's not lacking substance or value. But your faith, it will produce the desired outcome. So what, is the resurre- what does the resurrection mean for us? Just three things. Like, may this be an encouragement to us. Not that I just have three things as opposed to seven things. That's not what I mean. Like, don't be, like, you can be encouraged in that. But be encouraged in these three things. Right? You with me? Number one is that we can rest knowing that All our sins are forgiven. Isn't that good news? Man, that's good news. And look, we can rest in that. Like sins, like the picture of sin is like, it's like an archery terminology. So you, you got shooting the bow and what, Guys, you know, hit or miss. They got like flags. Oh, that was a hit. We hit it. Like it's the miss flag. That's what sin is. When you miss the mark and the mark is God's perfection and God's holiness. And sin isn't, I say this all this time. Sin isn't just the bad things that you've done or you haven't done or you're currently doing. It's what's in us as well. It's the thoughts that we think it's the it's the jealousy that sometimes drives us it's the anger and the rage that we feel it's the malice that we have towards others it's the lust that we feel it's the, the desires for the things of the world and the pleasures of the world it's on and on and on it's it's the things that we do and it's the things that we fail to do and it's the things that we sometimes think, and it's the things that sometimes drive us. That's what sins are. The scripture says like sins are like, they're like, they're like stains on a garment. Right? You remember like Easter when you were like kids and your parents bought you like your that little Easter outfit, right? You know, I remember one Easter that I got a, I got a gray suit. Um, and I, I was like so stoked because I, I already had picked out um, a T-shirt I was going to wear under it. And, and I was going to wear my loafers with no socks, just like Sonny Crockett off Miami Vice. That was my plan. I already knew it. I was going to try to sneak one of my plastic guns and put it right in here because that's what Sonny did. And then my mom said, no, you have to wear a pink button-up shirt, which I did not think was all that cool because I'd never seen Sonny nor Bo or Luke Duke ever wear pink. And so I wasn't for that. But nevertheless, that's what she made me wear. And then we would go to church at my grandfather's church in Versailles is where we would go. And my grandfather was the pastor there. And so he lived in the parsonage, which is the house owned by the church, like beside in the same yard. It's this huge yard. And he pastored Glens Creek Baptist Church, which there's an actual creek that runs there. And so like church would let out and then we would run out and run into the yard and play and all that. And then like at some point I would look down and I had done it. I'd gotten grass stains on my new suit, right? 
And then what it would my reaction would be to run and to hide from my mom so that she didn't see the grass stains. My reaction would be to try to somehow to like rub them out myself so that she didn't see the grass stains. And like, that's the way our sin is. It, it stains us. And our reaction is in our, in our stained garments is to run from the one who has the power to cleanse us. It's to try to cleanse ourselves when he's already like claimed, like, come and I will cleanse you. Come and I will, I will wash you. The, the, the truth is that, like, if we're just honest, that many of us, we've, we've done terrible things, right? You've said some terrible things. You've had some terrible thoughts. You've lived, some of you, terrible lives in consideration with God's holiness and God's, and God's perfection. But what Paul has already written in 1 Corinthians, in the sixth chapter, he says this, he gives this list, this like almost like a laundry list that he goes that liars and adulterers and the sexually immoral and this and this and this and this, that these people, these kinds of people will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then in verse 11, he says this, some of the most beautiful texts of scripture in all the Bible, where he says this, he says, and such were some of you. Like that's who you were. Those are the garments that you used to wear, stained by your sin and stained by your, your actions, but you were washed, you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of God that he has washed, he has washed our sins away. Like even more than like washing our sins away, he gives us new garments to wear. It's like a white suit with snakeskin boots, right? Like that's what he, guys, that's what he gives you to wear. Women's like a beautiful white dazzling dress. Like that's what he gives you to wear. And he doesn't give this to wear and say like, okay, now don't get it dirty or I'm going to get you. Like he, he, he puts it on you. And at some point this illustration breaks down and he like puts, sprays it with stain guard. Right? So even though you, you sin and you do, but it like, shh, it doesn't stick. But it's not that we're just resting in it's not that we're just resting in, oh, my, all my sins are forgiven. So Paul, Romans, I read Romans 5, Romans 6, he, he hits this argument. What does that mean then? If there's grace for sinners, does that mean we just continue sinning and sinning and sinning? So the more sin we do, the more grace we experience. And then what Paul says this, Romans 6, no, absolutely not. And then he says, how can you? If your sins have truly been forgiven, like if you've truly have received this new suit with the stain guard on it, if you've really received Christ and you're now standing in Christ, it doesn't free you to sin, but it frees you to live for him. It frees you, point number two, to, to joyfully pursue new life in Christ. That not only are we currently resting in the forgiveness of our sin, but we are also joyfully laboring. We're joyfully pursuing new life in Christ. This is, this is the Easter picture. This is Good Friday and today for us as believers. This is what our baptism means. That we, in baptism, he says, it's a picture of this occurring that you have been joined with Christ and you have experienced a death like Christ's death. So if you were baptized, hopefully you were baptized by immersion because that's the picture for us, we got a big tank around the corner. We drag it out. We put it up here. We fill it, fill it full of halfway clean, halfway warm water. We sit someone down and then we, we take them into the watery grave that is baptism, symbolizing Jesus dying and being put into a grave. This is your old life and it is being put to death. When I baptize somebody, I, they want to come up, but I just kind of hold them down there for a second. You know? Like, stay, remember this. Don't ever forget this, that you have died. But look, look, you're being resurrected with Christ, that as Christ was resurrected, what that means for us is new life that we can experience, 
that we can have, we can have as ours is this resurrected new life as, as all of our sins have died. And now we can live, I think we always say, now you can walk in the obedience that goes with this, with this new life. We can joyfully pursue it. And that's what Paul even says. Paul even says this in this text about his own life. He says in verse 9, he says, For I'm the least of the apostles. This is part like he appeared even to me that on the Damascus road, I saw Christ. I heard him speak. He appeared to me, the least of the apostles. For I'm least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle. Why? Why would you say that, Paul? Because I persecuted the church of God, that I, I was a murderer. I was a persecutor. That's, that's who I was. But look, but, the, but by the grace of God, I am now what I am. I am what I am. Like that's part of my past, but that's not my future. That's not my, my now even. I'm no longer a murderer. I'm now a child of God. I am what I am is what he says. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Now, look, he's not saying I worked harder for salvation than any of the rest of them. What he's saying is, is like when I realized what a sinner and what a fool I was trying to murder and try to persecute, that I, when I realized that I deserved death, but understood that Jesus died for me, when I understood how big his grace is to me, when his grace was magnified, it's caused me to work harder to make his grace known all the more. It's caused me, whenever I understand myself fully as a sinner, when we understand ourselves and all that we've done to sin against him, it should drive us to love him all the more. So it's all, his love awakens our love, and that's what he's saying. His grace and his love has awakened me, and it's caused me to, to labor, to pursue all the more. I've worked harder than all of the rest of them. It's not just him, though, notice. It's not just me working Though it was not, he says it in verse 10. And by his grace toward me, it was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but it was the grace of God that is within me. Like that's what it means to be a Christian. Is God supplies his grace, his power, his strength, through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in you, empowering you to experience new life. And our job is to labor as we cultivate that spirit in us, as we, as we work to cultivate and to walk in the truths that are congruent with that declaration of who we are in him. And lastly, we can trust that we will experience eternity free from the presence of sin and in the presence of God. That's really the summation of why Paul's writing this chapter on resurrection. Like 15th chapter, the book of 1 Corinthians deals with resurrection. It deals with Christ's resurrection in order for Paul to clear up this misteaching, this false teaching that had come in that said there's no resurrection of the dead. Like they, they were saying, there's no, like there's never going to be a time when you're going to be resurrected. Like you can live and you can know Christ, but then you're going to die and then you'll just be kind of be worm food. And what Paul's saying is, no, we look to Christ's resurrection as proof of our resurrection, that there's coming a time for you and I that we will be resurrected from the dead. We, we trust in that. We hope in that. That is our future. That is, what we're, that is what we're looking forward to, that Jesus, he's called Jesus. Jesus is the first fruits. He's the first one. Jesus has suffered, died, and been resurrected, ascended into heaven to the glory of God. You and I, as followers of Christ, we will suffer, we will die, we'll be resurrected from the dead, be ascended to be with Jesus. That's that is what he's true. That is what he's teaching. That is the truth. That's a glorious truth. A glorious thought for us. So we look forward to it. At least it should be a glorious thought to us. 
If it's not a glorious thought, like, why isn't it that oftentimes when I talk with people who are unbelievers, when I spend time with them, I'm reminded of just the fear that accompanies thoughts of death. Like, I get it. I'm not some super Christian, like, you know? Like, I, I do think that I do have a spiritual gift, and I think my spiritual gift is the spiritual gift of martyrdom. Like, like I think that's probably my greatest spiritual gift is to, but it's the spiritual gift you only get to use once, but still, I think that's probably my spiritual gift is, is, to, is to do that. But even in that, as I think about that, like, I don't, like, I'm like the old Southern Gospel song. I think it was a Southern Gospel song that said, everybody wants to go to heaven. Is it? No, it's, uh, that was, um, who? But nobody wants to die. Dave Crowder. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Like, I get that. I resonate that. But even as I think about death, there's, that fear is, has been absorbed by the truth that I believe that just as Jesus was been resurrected, that I too will be resurrected. And like I'm living life now, we as believers should be living life now, waiting and hoping and believing to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Like what I believe will occur is however it's going to take place, I'm going to die and then my eyes are going to be awakened and I'm going to see Jesus on his throne. And I'm living my life, not perfectly, but I'm living living my life clinging to a Savior so that I may hear, well done, good and faithful servant. As C.S. Lewis said, there's two types of people. There are the type of people that pray to God and say, God, your will be done. And then they live lives trying to live by his will. And then there's another type of people. There are those that God says to them, that God speaks to them, your will be done. And he allows them to live their lives according to their own will. And those are the people who are the most fearful. But we are the people who are filled with hope and filled with trust as we stand before Jesus to hear that. Let me just ask you, Last few questions. Let me ask you, like, have you surrendered? Have you fully surrendered to the will of God in your life? Like, I think you know that or not. I think that's something that you know in your heart. Like, have you, have you surrendered to him? Have you surrendered to all that he may have and to all that he is? And you're the one saying, you, God, you, your will be done in my life. Like, is that you or are you still the one like paying God lip service, attending some services, hoping that Jesus sprinkles some Jesus dust on some of the things that you do? And ultimately, you're just like living your life for you. Like, it's huge because one is true salvation and the other is You fooling yourself into thinking that you're a convert when in reality you're not. The picture of salvation is the picture of of surrender. It's faith in him and all that he is. It's total surrender to him. So have you surrendered to Christ? Have you surrendered to Christ and have you followed that in baptism? It's important. It pictures what Christ does on the inside. So, and, and, and like, well, no, but, uh, you know, that's, that's hard on my pride. Like, and salvation isn't, right? Like, I don't want to get up in front of all those people. Really? And the declaration of your heart of Jesus is all for you and your will be done, except for, have, have you surrendered to Christ? Have you been baptized? And are you continuing to be saved by that? Are you still holding fast, as Paul says here, to the gospel? Or is your grip loosened? This morning, we come and we remember Jesus. We remember what Paul just said, the truth of the gospel.
Christ has died for your sins. Christ has been buried. Christ is resurrected from the dead on the third day. We remember that, especially his death through this bread and through this cup. That if you are a believer and a repentant follower of Christ, then we invite you to come and to celebrate Christ through t- the taking of the Lord's Supper. The way that we do it here is we take a piece of bread and we dip it in this cup. And either you can eat it here or in one of the stations in the back, or you can take it back to um, your seat. As Pres- Pastor Brian said in the, in the welcome, there'll be pastors in the back that would love nothing more than to pray for you. Offerings, baskets that are in the back behind the middle section. If you're part of the Point Community Church, you call it home. It's our joy and privilege to give.